Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. Dan and I are executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this show. Today on Free Thought Matters, we'll be talking to Candace Gorham, a licensed mental health counselor. She'll be talking about the intersection of atheism and grief. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. How do non religious people deal with death? our own mortality, and the death of a loved one. Our guest today has some answers. Candace Gorham is a former Christian minister who's now an atheist activist and an author. She writes about religion, secular social justice, and the African-American community. Candace has worked as a licensed mental health counselor for more than 10 years, focusing on at-risk youth and family therapy. Candace Gorham is a member of the Black Humanist Alliance of the American Humanist Association, the Secular Therapist Project, the Clergy Project, and the Secular Student Alliance's Speakers Bureau. We talked with Candace on this show about her first book, The Ebony Exodus Project, and now she has a new book called On Death, Dying, and Disbelief, published by Pitchstone Publications this fall. She lives in North Carolina with her teenage daughter. Thank you for joining us today, Candace. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So you were a former minister like me. I, I have to ask you, isn't this a lot more fun than preaching? Definitely. <laughs> you were a Pentecostal, is that right? Well, we were non-denominational, but definitely of the Pentecostal holiness over the top persuasion. Uh -huh. Did you speak in tongues and do faith healing and all that stuff? Yes, <laughs> yes. I prophesied, spoke in tongues, faith healing, cast out demons, wow. all of that. Mm -hmm. So demons, uh, you know, in the Bible they thought demon, mental health problems were demon problems, but now you're dealing with the real medical scientific issues of, of mental health. Mm -hmm. So, Candace, just briefly, um, you were so religious that you actually were a minister. How did you lose your faith? Yeah, um, so I, I kind of got lucky, I guess you could say, where um, the church that I was a member of that was of the more extreme persuasion, um, that pastor, um, it was actually my sister and her husband, and the pastor and my, my sister moved away to another state. And so that gave me the opportunity to join a less extreme church. Um, unfortunately, during that time, I was going through some things in my personal life, um, you know, some just some really stressful things. My life was it felt like my life was falling apart. Um, mental illness was one of the big issues. Depression was a big issue that was going on in my life. And I felt like I must be doing something wrong. You know, I must be missing the mark somewhere. There's something that God maybe wants to, me to know that I'm missing. And so I just started studying more. I started opening opening myself up to ideas and, um, you know, religious, studying religious texts that maybe I had never studied before, listening to, to people that I had never considered more. Um, and slowly but surely over time, I basically studied myself out of religion and studied myself out of faith. So there was nothing, you know, about being angry with God or anything like that. I literally just studied myself out of faith. 
-hmm. you thought your way out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I can remember, Candace, that you told me that you belonged, to the, that the Pentecostal congregations that you were belonging to engaged in long fasting and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you, in a sense, you went through a lot of abuse in your religion. I definitely, you know, upon reflection, would say that it would qualify as abuse, you know, to some degree. Definitely psychological abuse, um, neglect. And like you said, we put our bodies through things that we should not have. I mean, we would fast as much as 10 days with no food, you know, no juice, just water, um, you know, and and suffer effects from it. Well, congratulations for, if I borrow a phrase, for seeing the light. Um, <laughs> and, and like me, you came out of it. and. Uh, you and I are both uh, participants in the clergy project, but before we talk about your new book about death and dying and, and disbelief, uh, your earlier book is called The Ebony Exodus Project. What is that book about? Mm -hmm. So the meat of the book is um, 10 stories from black women who have left religion. Um, and I let them basically tell their stories you know what are their experiences with religion um, from their childhood to present day and why they left religion or why they separated from you know and, and what that was like for them and in addition to those stories I also sort of interspersed those stories with um, you know hard research and information about um, the ways in which um, sort of like the standard of living for black women is not that great in America. So I look at physical health and mental health and, um, you know, just social standing in America, basically, um, and how those things had, you know, basically the promise, the, the church has made promises to, you know, black people and black women, especially who are the backbone of the black church, you know, that we should be happy, healthy, wealthy and wise. And when you look at the statistics and when you look at the quality of life for black women, it doesn't stand up. It doesn't line up to what we've been promised. And so there are those other research based chapters that look at those um, those statistics. So, Candace, you've written a new book. And uh, I take it you wrote a lot of that during the pandemic about um, disbelief, dying, and grief. What prompted you to write this book? Yeah, so in 2019, my high school sweetheart died um, um, tragically. He was in a car accident. And um, he was much more than just a high school sweetheart to me. I mean, we had reconnected later in life. And, you know, we were much more than just, you know, old high school sweethearts, you know, we were really close again. We had become really close again. And um, so his death, mourning his death, I felt like I needed some way to sort of process that um, and, and, and deal with that. At the same time, I also had a couple of other friends who were going through some significant losses as well. And so just going, you know, sort of processing my own grief and trying to help them process their grief. Um, and then also just, you know, knowing what I know about mental health and knowing what I know about the, you know, the atheist community and how we don't have resources when it comes to grief, you know, grief, death dying that's kind of relegated to the realm of the spiritual you know spiritual people and supernatural beliefs and so we as people who don't believe in supernatural things we don't have really any resources to go to when we're grieving and so i just felt like who better than you know if somebody's got to do it you know and i'm a mental health professional let me do it and sort of dedicate it to my my high school sweetheart well it's a good book candace and we're going to start carrying it because we get asked a lot at the freedom from religion foundation as a non-believer what about funerals and memorials and dealing with death and grief and all that as i was reading your book i was noticing these occasional asterisks that were just in the text here and there and later on, you explain what these asterisks were for. And I, I, was, I was wondering when I was reading, what are these little asterisks pointing out? What are those asterisks in your book? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as you can imagine, um, the book is part journal. You know, it's my, I'm 
I'm very, I mean, almost to the point of being graphic about my grief. Um, and so there would be times that I would be writing and, you know, with literal tears streaming down my face and dropping onto my keyboard, you know, barely able to, to continue my writing process, sometimes having to, you know, close my laptop and just throw myself down on the bed and cry. And so at those times when I was in the middle of writing, if I would start crying, I would put that those, those little stars in there. And um, one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, the connection that I felt with my some of my friends who were grieving um, and how, you know, it was just nice to have somebody to cry with sometimes, you know, and I'm thinking in addition to. Um, you know, it being a way for me to honor my loved one and, and recognize, you know, it kind of recognize that pain. I felt like it might also be a way to connect with a grieving reader as well. So Candace, your book offers 10 tips for somebody who is dealing with um, grief um, and that kind of thing. And so let's, um, let's look at the first tip. Um, and that is yes, you can grieve without a deeper supernatural meaning. So this is a, it's like a self-help book for non-religious people. So briefly, um, tell us more about that tip. So one of the things that you come across a lot is people have these experiences that they want to ascribe to supernatural happenings. You know, they dream about the dead person. Maybe they think they hear the dead person's voice, you know, that sort of thing. And so they sort of say, oh, you know, spiritual people or, you know, people who are still believers might say, oh, that's a sign that, you know, that person is in heaven trying to communicate with you. And so I just want to sort of normal in that tip. I try to normalize those experiences and say, you know, this is just a function of the depth of your grief um, and that it's not necessarily a spiritual experience and it shouldn't be something that you worry, oh, my God, am I, you know, slipping back into supernatural ways of thinking because I'm having these experiences. When my mom died in 2004, my dad, they were both atheists at the time. Uh, my dad, uh, weeks later, would hear her voice calling his name and he would turn to look into the living room or wherever. And dad said he knew he wasn't really hearing her voice, but it sounded powerful. And he was rational about it, but he still had this emotional a kind of a spooky experience that was going on. And I'm sure you've dealt yeah. with other people who have had those kinds of experiences, even without believing in the supernatural. Right. Well, and I definitely experienced it myself, you okay. know. And so, to, like I said, the whole point there is to sort of normalize that a lot of grieving people have that experience. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're losing grip with reality and you're going to, you know, suddenly become a Christian all <laughs> over again. <laughs> so your tip number two says... Be patient with your spiritual loved ones. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Again, you know, we're in a, especially in America, right? We're in a very religious society. You know, a good majority of the people have some sort of a sp spiritual belief of some sort. Um, and like I say, you know, grief, death, dying, that's kind of relegated to the realm of spiritual and supernatural beliefs. So it's not uncommon. I mean, you, you almost should expect that other people who are, um, you know, your other friends and family are going to have the same spiritual, um, ex I mean, I'm sorry, like sort of supernatural type experiences and that they are going to be walking around with their spiritual beliefs. They're going to be wishing and hoping that the person is seeing them, you know, watching over them from heaven and communicating with them. And, um, you know, and I, I, I just sort of try to instill, you know, some compassion in that time to say, you know, don't waste your energy on being angry with people for stuff like that. Like, you don't have enough energy for that. Let them grieve in their own way while you're grieving in your own way. And, and you know, be patient and recognize this is the society that we live in, you know, and it's going to happen and just sort of let people grieve in their own way as, as you try to grieve in your own way as well. So one, one more tip before we take a break, and that is your tip, take care of yourself, take care of your physical self. Mm hmm. Yeah. One of the things I was going through some pretty significant health issues and I got really sick um, during my went during the depths of my mourning period. And so I talk a, quite a bit about making sure that you're eating. You know, it's very the book is very practical. And that chapter, I feel like it's probably one of my most practical chapters where, you know, eat 
drink, go see the doctor, take your medication, sleep. You know, those really big, go outside so that that helps regulate your sleep cycle. Just really basic, tangible things. And the reason that we need to be told these really basic things is because our brain sometimes you know, shuts off. And when we're really, really in the depths of our grief, you know, we forget some of these most basic things and we just need somebody else to think for us and to remind us to take care of ourselves and the ways in which we need to take care of ourselves. So we're going to take a break here, Candace. After the break, we'll talk uh, beyond the physical needs. We're going to talk about your psychological and emotional needs. We're talking with Candace Gorham, author of the new book, on death, dying, and disbelief. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed, as you may be, by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker with Annie Laurie Gaylor, and we're continuing our conversation with Candace Gorham about her new book on death dying and disbelief. And you had a question yeah, first? Yeah, I had a question about this tip that you had, um, number two, to be patient with your religious friends, for example. But also, Candace, what about those of us who uh, have a loved one die, we're grieving, and somebody religious is making our life very uncomfortable, you know, there. Yes. What do, what do you re recommend for that person? And now that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because I do absolutely say in that chapter, do not let anybody, you know, run over you if you're not interested or if you're not comfortable in receiving support because, it, you know, it's really, again, it's really natural for a lot of people to sort of, oh, I'll be praying for you, you know, that sort of thing. They And maybe they may even want to physically stop and pray f with you and for you. And if you're not comfortable for that, you should absolutely feel, you know, absolutely stop and speak up for yourself and not allow yourself to be, you know, um, maybe bullied or, or even just overly, um, you know, to, if people are trying to, you know, offer you condolences in ways that are making you uncomfortable, absolutely stand seems, up for yourself. Where it seems coercive. So that leads to tip number four, uh, your tip number four, attend to your psychological and emotional needs. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so I'm a little bit biased as a mental health counselor, of course. Um, but I do, you know, say wholeheartedly, you know, I take my own medications for mental health, you know, issues. And I'm, I'm very open about that. And I'm always telling people, take your, you know, if, go see a doctor, take medications if you need to. One of the things I try to make a good point about is that if you've never been diagnosed with a mental health issue, it doesn't mean that you may not benefit from mental health medications at this time. You know, if you're experiencing depression type symptoms, if your body is short on, you know, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, you may need a little boost right now. You know, going through these stresses stressful situations like this will deplete hormones, chemicals, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, if you're having bad panic attacks at work, some anti-anxiety medicine may be exactly what you need to sort of get through the day and, and to not be afraid to try those things. Tip number five, there is no time limit on grief. Be patient with yourself. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, exactly what it says, you know, there's no time limit, right? You know, it could take as long as it as it needs to as you just never know how long it's going to take. Um, I do talk some about um, what we call per persistent bereavement um, disorder and, you know, how that to keep that in mind that, you know, there's there's a balance, right? There's a balance between um, a grief period and, and being patient with yourself and taking as much time as you need and not letting, you know, people sort of you know, say to you, hey, you need to hurry up and move on, but also keeping a watch on your mental health as well to make sure that you're not, you know, 
for lack of a better way to say, you know, not kind of going over the deep end and, and you know, and the depression is not getting too deep and too severe because it, cause it can get really deep, really severe, uh, really quickly. And so you do kind of have to manage both of those things. So are you saying that we should never tell somebody it's time to move on? Well, one of the things I talk about is that you have to you have to be mindful of like where that's coming from, right? I and I talk about how we can support other people who are grieving, and I do say, you know, I I, I don't think that a grieving person would appreciate being told it's time to move on. Uh-huh. There are ways that you can help a person move on without saying it's time uh-huh. to move on. <laughs> hmm. And so I do, you know, sort of give some tips in the book to those who are trying to support people who are in mourning and ways that they can help them move on without saying it's time to move on. Because I don't think that's ever going to be a helpful phrase. So, so one of those tips um, about uh, what to do, maybe not to move on, but just to, to feel better, is your tip number six, reconnect with nature. You mentioned that briefly. Um, are there studies about that? Yeah, there's a, quite a bit of information, a lot, quite a bit of research that talks about the benefits of exposure to nature, even just um, even if you can't be physically in nature, exposure to nat- images of nature help with um, recovery. You know, there was a really famous study um, of heart patient surgery, um, um, patient, heart surgery patients, um, and how just being able to look out of a window, those patients who had windows in their room and were able to look out of windows recovered faster and needed less medication than those who were not able to. Um, And so there's actually quite a bit of research that talks about the benefits of spending time outside. Uh, You know, it's going to be good for helping regulate your sleep, um, you know, like I said, just that exposure. And, you know, obviously, if you do things like exercise, that sort of stuff outside, that's also going to help with sleep. Um, it helps regulate melatonin. So exposure to sunlight helps re- regulate melatonin, that sort of thing. So there's quite a bit of research for that. So your tips really apply almost to everybody. I mean, some of them are kind of geared at the non-religious, but uh, a lot of these are just common sense tips, like tip, tip, tip number seven, postpone major decisions. And I know that's always the advice they give people, especially when they lose a spouse. Yes, yes. So I talk about um, this research again about um, how st- um, stress impacts our decision-making abilities and how putting that stress and that strain on our brain causes us to basically go into a sort of an autopilot mode where we then start running off of old scripts and we start we may revert back to old decision making strategies or or you know engaging in the world or behaving in ways that are not adaptive to what we need because we're stressed out and all we do is to revert back to what's easiest to do and if you think about for example being stressed out we overeat right or we might or maybe we don't eat enough you know because we we just our bodies will revert back to trying to do things that will Will make it feel as good as it can possibly do or to numb it out as much as it possibly can um, and so when you're in that state your brain is not able to make the best decisions that it can and so I it, so I talk, talk about that research there of, um, of that brain research specifically about decision making so atheists and agnostics and non-believers often don't have the same kind of rituals or formality in their life that a lot of religious people do. But your tip number eight suggests that we should do something in honor, in the honor of the person, do something in their honor of the person who died. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think doing something for somebody else always makes us feel good. Whether that person is there to see it and to recognize it or not, it always helps us feel good when we do something for somebody else. And I think that it's the same, you know, in death. Um, You know, something, you know, run a a, a 5K in their honor or, you know, go to the beach and sit by the beach and, 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 think about them or plant a garden in their honor. You know, it could be anything. It's, you know, of course, you know, I kind of 
make the, you know, I kind of laugh in the book and say, you know, not everybody can write a book. You know, I wrote a book in his honor. Not everybody has that, you know, that opportunity to do that. But if you can, that's great, right? Anything that you can do to honor your loved one is probably going to help you feel better. I think that's a great tip. Um, now, tip, num tip number nine, maybe people don't need advice on this so much huh. as you're acknowledging cry, cry, and then cry some more. Mm-hmm. And I do, and I do try to balance that out because I know there's a lot of people who, you know, you may cry too much, right? You you might be overly depressed, and you kind of need to balance that out and manage that. But I do, I talk, you know, I talk about the research there about the benefits of crying and and how there are, you know, things like you know stress hormones that we secrete in our tears when we cry, or how um, you know our bodies produce endogenous opioids, you know, to that increase our pain tolerance. Um, you know, we produce oxytocin that help us feel bonded to other people um, when we cry. And so I, I try to get into, again, you know, the actual research that talks about the benefits of crying and um, and how, you know, for some people, people, you know, there are plenty of people. I did. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, you know, I don't cry. I, I have a hard time crying. And so that chapter is kind of for that person right there, you know, that says if you have a hard time crying, you might want to consider that, you know, that you might get some benefits out of crying even though it's horrible and it's not fun and it's a miserable experience you know when all is said and done you may actually end up getting some benefits out of it so candace we have 60 seconds left your tip number 10 says caring for others who are grieving what kind of things can we do to care for others who are grieving Oh, man, go clean up the house, babysit for them, you know, take them somewhere. Just be there. Just sit with them and cry with them. Let them cry with you. Um, anything that you can do, at, you know, do not be coercive. Like we were saying, you know, don't try to tell them, you know, what to do and how to move on and that sort of thing. But just being pr present with a person and, and helping them out and asking them how you can help them um, is, is invaluable. So, Candace, thank you so much for joining us. You've written a book that is really important because so many people um, diminish the idea um, of atheists and grief and dying. And I think perhaps those of us who know this is the only world, um, this is the only life, probably take grief and dying even harder. So it's a thank real you. valuable contribution that you've made. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, and thank you, viewers, for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.